Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Tales, a podcast from Afar Media. I'm your host, Senior Editor Aislinn Green, and for the past six years, I've had the pleasure of working with some of the most creative and interesting people in the world. Comedians, philosophers, novelists, they've all shared their stories with Afar's readers about getting out into the world and just reveling in it. And now, each week on Travel Tales, we'll hear from some of our favorite contributors about a trip that changed their life. And because the world is really anything but normal right now, thanks to COVID-19, I'm recording all of this from my houseboat in California. In this episode, we meet Ryan Knighton, an author, screenwriter, and one of Afar's contributing writers. Ryan is also blind, but that has never stopped him from embracing adventure. And so we wondered, what would it be like for him to go on safari? Some people might assume it's all about eyesight on a safari. I mean, I know I did. But what's it like when we tune into our other senses? A lot, it turns out. Soon it will be time for another adventure. But for now, enjoy these stories from travelers who have connected to our world on a deeper level and let them fuel your dreams of a future adventure. And with the Marriott Bonvoy Boundless Card, you'll be well on your way to powerful new experiences. Learn more at MarriottBoundlessCard.com. My wife and I had only been in Zimbabwe on safari for a few hours as our land cruiser nosed through the bush and cicadas buzzed overhead like power lines. Our guide, Alan, had already spotted several fleeting species of antelope, and I was already getting concerned that as a blind man, yeah, this was going to kind of suck. I mean, I might as well be at a drive-in movie. Close your eyes. Hey, over there is a kudu. Whatever a kudu is. Welcome to a blind safari. Our driver, Darmish, pulled over, and Alan suggested in his lovely baritone that we get out and stretch our legs and have a drink, or what he called a sundowner. Off in the distance, a giraffe was slipping into the trees, and Alan began his work describing the animal and its place in the ecosystem of this, the Malalangwe Game Reserve. How a blind man such as myself could be connected to the unseen sights of an unseen place would be Alan's challenge for the next few days. Me, I wanted to explore what a safari could reveal to the remaining spectrum of my senses. Well, So far, I'd nursed a beer and I'd heard a rumor of a giraffe. Suddenly, Alan's hand clamped down on my shoulder, communicating everything in a grip. Adrenaline shot through me. We were surrounded by bush and shadow and something else. Something not so giraffe. Alan's hand pivoted me, aiming my attention like a satellite dish. Elephant, he whispered, 25 meters away. I strained to hear it, to hear anything, really. Was it moving? Had it seen us? Alan's hand squeezed my shoulder. Then again, and again, and again, imitating the steps of the animal. Fifteen meters away, he whispered. I didn't know where our land cruiser was or how far we were from its safety. Alan's hand assured me that everything was fine, but his constant grip implied that everything could change in an instant. Ten meters. Finally, the faintest sound. The plodding of a six-ton bull. An elephant's unstructured feet expand with every step, making a dispirited squish, like spiking a semi-deflated football. Now I knew how something so large could glide so quietly through the forest. Squish, squish, It lumbered towards us, deciding whether to charge. Then, squish, squish, it shuffled off into the forest and was gone. An odor followed. I could smell wet earth. Alan would later explain to me that I had smelled the elephant's method of cooling and hygiene. Mud retains moisture, so elephants paint themselves in it to stay cool. When it dries, they scrape themselves against leadwood and baobab trees to remove the hardened earth and any parasites from their skin. Basically, it's an elephant waxing. Now, I hadn't seen one, but...
but I'd already smelled and heard my way into some of the marvelous biology around us. Singita's Pamashana Lodge is a stunning nest of thatched villas perched atop the sandstone cliffs of Malalangwe Lake. Most animals are out early in search of water before the day's heat can stamp every living thing into lethargy, so the aspiration is to be on safari by dawn. We had barely descended the cliffs and we were nearing a pond when Alan flagged Darmish to pull over. He got out and disappeared into the forest. You know, as if he was popping into a convenience store, not an ecosystem that could hide a lion. Here, he said when he returned, chew these. I didn't know what these were, but I put leafy bits into my face and began to chew, being the ever-compliant Canadian that I am. Instantly, my tongue went dry. Like, ridiculously dry. That's from all the tannins, Alan explained. You're chewing on the leaf of the mapani tree. Most animals can't digest it, and now you know why. But elephants can, and they need a food source with little competition, given how large they are. More than a botany lesson under the sun, I was glimpsing a way of guiding that used an animal's sensory experience as a point of entry. Leaves are food, so Alan had us engage them by taste. Most guides would point to the distance and label sites with facts and names like captions. Over there is Mapani, elephants eat those. That's acacia, giraffes dig those. But that wasn't Alan's style. He wanted us to literally experience the ecology around us as an evolving system of tastes and survival. Afar Travel Tales, presented by the Marriott Bonvoy Boundless Card from Chase, is a powerful way to connect through stories of travel. Stories move us. They take us across the world and into the unknown. Stories inspire us to ask questions and dream of possibilities. The experiences we share give us a glimpse of where we could go, what we could learn, how we could grow. We hope the stories here will lift you up and give you inspiration for adventures to come. Until then, the Marriott Bonvoy Boundless Card can help you on your way to future destinations. Learn more at marriottboundlesscard.com. Soon two white rhinos appeared, a mother and a calf. I could hear them snorting and stamping in the mud, all of it just a few feet from us. But something was troubling the water off to the right as well. "Uh Uh-oh, Darmish said, and I felt this familiar tingle in my spine. It's the tension that precedes violence. Three hyenas were stalking the rhinos as they continued to drink, completely unfazed. Most people go on safari with a desire, above all else, to photograph a lion. If you ask Alan, though, this is the least interesting pursuit. Lions sleep a lot. Lions basically are photographs. Me, I'm not so into photographs. But as I listened to those hyenas drink, I realized how much I wanted to hear one of them laugh. If I could, it would be kind of like a trophy of sound I could take home. But the hyenas didn't give up a peep. They just finished drinking, and then they darted off into the hills. But not before the largest one dropped the nastiest, most eye-burning carnivore fart ever blown into the face of a blind man. It's as if she knew I wanted to hear her laugh, and instead mocked me by obliterating my sense of smell. When you're a blind man strapped to the chair of a tracker seat on the grill of a land cruiser, You feel as if you're floating through the air, because you are. You also feel like a hunk of bait, because you are. Within a few days under Alan's tutelage, I could flag for Darmesh to stop if I smelled something disrupting the umbrella trees around us. A thin marbling in the air, something sour and sweaty like a horse. Moments later, maybe 50 yards away, a giraffe would appear. But I didn't catch a whiff of anything. The afternoon, Darmesh suddenly locked up the brakes, and Alan's hand shot through the open windshield of the Land Cruiser and clamped down on my shoulder on that tracker's seat. 
Don't move, he said. Black rhino. Quick movements can startle rhinos into a charge. Black rhinos, in particular, are nervous and prone to fight. Quickly, Alan began to whistle, small and unthreatening like a little bird, just to let it know that we were here. It turns out black rhinos are nearly blind, and irony is abundant in the bush. Still, the rhino charged at me, and then it stopped. And then I heard it charge again, and it stopped. Then the rhino and I faced each other and hid in our respective silences until it went off into the forest and it was gone. And I retired my experiment as a tracker. On our last day, a call came over the radio. Five hyenas had been spotted in a watering pan about a half hour's drive from where we were. By the time we got there, they were still in the water with the leg of what Alan said looked like a heart of beast. But squaring off at the pan's edge was a pack of wild African hunting dogs, about 20 of them, although the species is nearly extinct. They were closing in either to take the hyena's kill or to pick a fight. The air smelled of blood. Hundreds of tiny birds called quelia tornadoed above us in a humming swarm. There was a hot wind in my face, and it came from their wings. Then I heard it. The nervous laugh of a hyena. It sounded like the forced chuckle of an old man after a bad joke. Suddenly there was an explosion of water as the dogs attacked and rushed into the pond, gnashing at the heels of the hyenas, mobbing, circling, confusing them from every angle. The cries of the wild African hunting dog are probably the strangest sound I've ever heard like a chorus of computerized, twittering birds. Vicious, they bit the hyenas. The hyenas bit back and laughed, or wounded, squealed like pigs in slaughter. On and on it went for hours. What else should you do but listen? Given the near extinction of those dogs, that hyena fight might have been the only sound of its kind made on the entire planet that day. And I can still hear it. That was Ryan Knighton. Ryan is quarantining like a good Canadian at home on the wild coast of Vancouver Island. It is its own safari, he says. The bears are awake, as are the sea lions. Ready for more travel stories? Visit us online at afar.com slash travel tales. And be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter. We're at Afar Media. If you enjoyed today's adventure, we hope you'll come back next week for more great stories. Subscribing makes this easy. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. And please be sure to rate and review us. It helps other travelers find the show. This has been Travel Tales, a production of Afar Media and Boom Integrated. Our podcast was produced by Aislinn Green, Adrian Glover, and Robin Lai. Post-production was by John Marshall Media staff Jen Grossman and Clint Rhodes. Music composition by Alan Kresha. And a special thanks to Laura Redmond, Sarah Storm, and Irene Wang. I'm Aislinn Green, your zoomed out, under-traveled host. I can't wait to hit the road again. Until we all freely can, remember that travel begins the moment we walk out our front door. Everyone has a travel tale. What's yours? <laughs>